and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Eclipse Entertainment, creators of the upcoming project Favor, tabletop role-playing in a neo-noir post-post-apocalypse. Try saying that five times fast. The one and only, don't call him Mr. Wonderful, but Dan Wonderbar. And I'm hoping I got that pronounced right. Thank you, thank you. That is all good. Oh gosh, and of course the dog's barking right outside the door. Sorry about that. Uh, oh, that was, a, that was a beautiful introduction. I love that. That was perfect. Couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I, often start, I often start with the humble beginnings in, in, this, kind of, in this kind of thing. So, of course. I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what was it that made it stick? Oh, yeah, that's a great start, yeah. So, for me, I started playing uh, TTRPG specifically about... Almost 10 years now, probably 8 years now, mm -hmm. when I first got invited to play a Warhammer 40k Death Watch game, which uh, is, I don't know how well known, like, the actual TTRPGs were for. Like, I know Warhammer as a, you know, the, the, franchise the, is fairly um, well known. The FFG run of Warhammer 40k is still, was still fairly respected, and for, That's a, great. for a good, for a good chunk of time, it, um, it it was it was when it came to when it came to sales wise at the very least with Dark Heresy it was competing with Pathfinder. Yeah, yeah, and um, it and it was mad fun too. Like it was, I think we we played a little bit of Dark Heresy, but like Death Watch was like the super powerful like epic level version of the whole shtick. Mm -hmm. So we got to like march around and be in like Space Marines and power armor and just like dropping in shooting stuff, and it was very. It was very like uh, rules heavy and detailed, as older systems def uh, more certainly are, and very. But, but it did a good job with this combat system, and it was just it was a good fun four hours on like a Sunday, just shooting the crap with friends and stuff. So that that was my first like introduction, getting to that. I had a fantastic DM and a really great group, which some of the people that I still mm -hmm. uh, I met from that group I still play with on the regular today. I'm a bit and curious. Just, I'm a bit curious if um if if any. Given that it, given that it's Death Watch, and given what was done with one of the first expansions to Death Watch, were you guys all running um, established chapters, or did they, or was did anybody try and do the create your own chapter um, approach? We did establish chapters because we didn't exactly we didn't know that the book that enables you to make your own chapters, which I think that's what's like rights of battle or something like that or whatever. Uh, we didn't actually know that book existed until like well after the fact, so we were playing all like the 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 basic ones, mm -hmm. and it was at it was at like that, t that period of time in like the early two thousands, um, where like there wasn't that much stuff on the on the internet, and wikis were very like scarce and stuff in the details they provided. Um, so it, was, it wasn't like you could just go and like look something up and like figure out, especially for like and even I think today there's like nothing for like the the ttrpgs um <laughs> or for uh for for 40k especially because because of the the actual like miniature tabletop game takes all the all the uh the top search results or whatever so you can't actually find anything in the first place for it but like we we just kind of had the books that were like at our disposal at the time uh and we all end up playing like just we had any random rolled for chapters or whatever so mm -hmm. i think oh. I, I end up playing like a um a um iron hands tech marine the first time i played and just walk uh, roll around roll around like a walking tank a little mad fun oh so oh so you were so you were the giant fucking nerd oh yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> indeed i was the nerd that could also take like a multi-melt of bomb to like the face and like just walk away you know um i ended that up was fun. i ended up play i the first time i ran death the first time i was a player in death watch i um i was a i was a, a i was an assault who Ooh, came, who came from st who came from the storm wardens oh that's awesome so you had like the, the that's like a pretty good combo too because they're like the melee people i think right they um, walk around with like swords and stuff if i'm remembering that correctly i don't remember <laughs> yeah. yeah um assault assault marines are the assault marines are the ones who all who um do who do a whole lot of hit and runs with jump with uh jump packs 
Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Gee, all that nostalgia. <laughs> so that's awesome. So there would be there would be frequent there would be frequent mom there would be there would be frequent moments where um where everybody else had everybody else had said be would say beware beware of beware of Philo. Um, Philo. Philo. First in, last out. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> that's true. Is that that's true? Like a retail um, thing for like cycling spoiled items, right there. <laughs> that's what I thought you were talking about for a second, but I guess it applies for combat situations too. Well, it was because it was because of the fact that uh, that um his his whole his whole po his whole policy was basically to di to dive bo to dive bomb just when combat starts. It's been, especially since as thing as things got on, things got on, um, instead in like he had he had initial at one early on he was early on he was using chain weapons and then late right. game he um he upgrade he upgrades that and, ma and manages to get manages to get a um a a, ha a power hammer. <laughs> oh, <laughs> very cool! So you just pancake people all day. <laughs> yeah, that's um, great. Of course, then then I ended up, um, then I ended up finding out about a infamous thread because because I was a frequenter on TG about the the um le the legend of caber tossing someone in Terminator armor. <laughs> Hot and easy feet. <laughs> um, was, and he had he had point because somebody had pointed out that because of because of the way exceptional strength works somebody could possibly j right. juggle terminate terminate <laughs> that's right because <laughs> math is weird in 40k mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but that be that being said given given that that was your given that that was your start um and that and 40k is def is definitely on the um space bonkers end of things Mm. I was gonna say space opera, but that, but um, that's that's the the it's a different thing. Yeah, the, it's similar, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> when it, whenever so, whenever somebody asks me what genre Warhammer 40k is, the answer I always give them is yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd be right. <laughs> you would be right. It's got a little bit of fantasy. It's got a ton of sci-fi. It's a bit, a bit of space opera. Mm -hmm. um, that's awesome. <laughs> But what I'm curious about is since, since favor is a it, you're bringing up um, concepts of post post apocalypse and neo noir with a That's lot right. of um, a lot of a lot of backdrop of cyberpunk when That's it comes right. to yeah. si when it comes to cyberpunk as ju as just a literary thing what was your introduction ga game wise or fiction wise oh that is a good question I don't know I'd be able to say for sure when i started getting exposed to this i think it was mostly through i gotta say honestly it's probably started when i started doing more writing on my own mm -hmm. which really happened about like five years ago or so when i started exploring like system creation and writing homebrew stuff and running my own games and really just doing a ton of like research and immersing myself in like online culture around doing writing a lot of like world building type stuff and when i started doing a lot of that i did a lot of exploring around to see like okay what other genres are out there what are what other stuff people are people doing and stumbling across cyberpunk and going oh this is a really interesting like post-apocalyptic like gritty setting where like morality is a super like interesting and malleable thing and people got these like cybernetic augments on them and stuff and you got all this like cool like dark but light aesthetic and stuff um and uh, i just started like reading different like book series um playing a little bit of like shadow run and stuff uh, um and just kind of going from I, I couldn't really i couldn't really tell you where exactly i i first stumbled across this but probably just through like forum browsing and just like wiki wiki reading and stuff mm -hmm. and given that given that given that because the reason i ask is is a lot of people, a lot of people, their int their introduction to cyberpunk was depending on the generation, Blade Runner or Ghost right, yeah. or Ghost in the Shell or um, I'd say or um, some or something more recent. Um, yeah, 
some in some cases I've seen in some cases I've seen Akira be used as someone's um, introduction. Hmm. But what? But um, for you, but what for you? What is what is the uh, what is the appeal of um, cyberpunk? Hmm. Like what do you what I think. What is what do you think it is about it that drew that drew you into using that as one of your backdrops? Mm, that's a great that's a good great question. I think for me personally, I have always been obsessed with stories revolving around a character that's in a sort that has to make a really has, has to make really tough decisions regarding morality and kind of in that gray space of it's kind of like the you know do you change the tracks on the train to save your buddy but you kill the you kill the other five people on the tracks uh it's like was the you know kind of the dealing with the, what is the value of a life uh and the trauma that comes from having to make those hard choices and i know this and this has always reflected in any character I, I end up playing in in ttrpgs i'm a part of uh, games i'm a part of uh is characters that have these intrinsic flaws that force them into these spaces where they have to make a hard choice um, where there's no real clear answer. Mm -hmm. And I think the appeal for cyberpunk for me, especially combining it with a sort of noir sort of theme, is kind of approaching a setting which is hard, which is gritty, which is unfair to the people at the bottom of the rung, uh, where, where like life generally sucks and nothing is nice. Um, and characters are often forced into the space where, like, you know, I have to live, so what do I do in order for me to live? Uh, and does that involve taking lives? Does it involve screwing other people over? How does family fit into that? Um, and for and for like cyberpunk, it's I feel like it's it's kind of taking that like elevated step to that, where it's in like a just dark, desolate future where you know humanity had its chance to get its stuff together, to create utopia, to and they had that chance and they failed. And it gets to space now where everything is run on money and on favors and on that whole shtick. Uh, and that's kind of, it's kind of similar to how uh, a lot of like noir stuff is, is also seen as well. A lot of back alley dealings, a lot of grim dark. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think a you know I think characters like you know that have to that are in that gray antihero sort of space fit really well into a setting like this so that that's really a draw for me personally is that is that kind of aspect to it so all right um now with that with that kind of thing in mind the other the other aspect the other aspects that i want that i wanted to touch on is the noir and the idea of post post-apocalypse mm. um i'll start yeah, with course. i'll start with the idea of, of neo-noir um was that another genre that you were that you introduced you just through the amount of research that you were doing? Yeah, so for for noir, that is a genre I haven't spent too too much time in, and uh, I couldn't. I one of those things I, I I couldn't really tell you where I was introduced to the that genre as a as a concept, uh, but when I was first talking with Niaz, who is the primary writer for favor mm -hmm. uh when i was first talking i was first writing favor i wrote the kind of pre pre alpha version of it and i was looking for someone on online who could help with the graphic formatting and doing all like the design for the actual book format and stuff or something i didn't know how to do mm -hmm. i met niaz and he was actually he actually could do that stuff and he could also do writing and stuff and so we managed we decided to collaborate together and he's the person that brought forth the idea of, okay, we have this cyberpunk theme. Why don't we also couple that with noir and kind of make a sort of like hybrid sort of like setting where you take the, the, those two um, themes and kind of put them together to kind of create this like neo-noir sort of thing. And that's what I, I, I really love that about our system is that we have this like super bright neon aesthetic that's also coupled with this really gritty, dark sort of noir theme of like, yeah, we got this post post apocalyptic world of like cybernetic augmentations and a lot of genetic manip manipulation and stuff, a lot of like fan a lot of sci fi elements that's kind of run in the world is kind of run in a very noir fashion of you know i'll do this for you you do this for me i know this guy or i had these contacts here or you know i'm pretty high up in this corporation so i can move this money around and kind of like very very like just kind of tying into that sort of those sort of like 
stereotypes and and staples of those of those two genres. All right. Now, when it now um, with that kind of thing in mind, when a lot with a lot of a lot of people's designs, um, they tend to they tend to be a response to something that they either want to see or something that that um was a frustration in uh, in other projects. Oh, that's Were th- a great question. Was there any <laughs> was there anything like that in the um initial de- in the initial design docs for favor? For sure. That is an awesome question. I'm super glad you asked that. And I feel especially if you're the way that you run your interviews, I feel like I can especially talk about this mm-hmm. is that favor I first started writing for favor a bit like mid last year. Um, when there was a ton of hype around Cyberpunk 2077, mm. and there was just a huge influx of people not only interested in Cyberpunk 2077 as a as a game, but also in the Cyberpunk genre as a as a whole, as a lot of newcomers and, and people that were interested in exploring this, um, which which was almost a niche sort of genre mm. um, before then, at least to the mainstream's eye, and uh, I just kind of like immersed in all this hype and reading about this stuff and was like, hey, it'd be a fun idea to try and create like a sort of like new cyberpunk sort of like um, game because we really haven't had like a super, super big in-depth sort of a TTRPG since like the, I think the, the last edition of, of Shadowrun was like 2019, but the edition before that was like 2016 and cyberpunk 2020 was like, that's like 2013. That's like... Uh, there was seven years old now. I do have I do have to correct on on one little thing. Oh, go for there it. was a there um in between 2020 and now red. There was a third edition, which is um contentious. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's fair. Yeah, and that, that's also a good, that's also a good point too. Is that like um especially earlier editions of, of Shadowrun were incredibly incredibly clunky. Uh, I remember using what's the it's like Chummer or whatever like the program that you have to use to like a third party program you had to use to build characters in older editions of, of Shadowrun. You didn't have you didn't need have it, to, but, yeah. but because but the the um big the big problem that Sh- that Shadowrun had for the for the longest time, and one and one that they started to acknowledge with um with um the priority system in fifth edition was choice paralysis because mm-hmm. the approach is okay you pick you you pick your met you pick your meta type you you uh, and you you get you um pick you get these amount of build points and you've got right. this much karma then you get pushed into the deep end of the pool and told swim damn it <laughs> and that's a very good analogy because I've I've often I've often joked that um, Shadowrun is a is a um, cl- is a class is a class based game that pretends that it isn't. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, I love Shadowrun to death, but let but let's be let's be flat out honest. You look at a, you look at a lot of people's characters, and they are going to fit within certain archetypes. I can look at somebody's sheet and say that's a rigger. I can look at somebody's sheet and go that's an adept. That's a decker. Or that's a technomancer. I don't know. I can, um, no accounting for taste there. <laughs> that that's a sh- that's a shaman. Um, that's a street that's a street Sam. You get you get the point. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, and so I I really kind of like was in this mindset like late. Um, uh, this be twenty yeah twenty twenty of like all right I want to build I want to build this new this new system and I want to take a lot of modern day approaches to like system creation with TTRPGs, Mm -hmm. which is what we're kind of seeing right now, especially just through recent Kickstarter games and stuff is Mm -hmm. a focus on building systems that are very rules light, that are very simplistic, that are very user friendly. I think because of how much there, of how much there's a huge influx of like new players into the TTRPG space because of like critical role and stranger things um, and all that jazz. And I think a lot of systems that are being put out nowadays are trying to captivate that notion of like easy to use user friendliness, like fifth edition D and D incredibly slimmed down from 3.5. Uh, Pathfinder second edition is doing that as well. 
um, and all these like all these like kind of newer editions of these past games are trying to emulate that. And so I was like, okay, I want to take a lot of these methods that are being used to create easy systems and then make a system that employs a lot of those methods on the front end, mm -hmm. but still allows for an incredible amount of versatility and variation and depth and progression to late game characters so that the stuff doesn't fall off towards the end of the towards the end of a end of a campaign. And that's kind of where that's kind of how the the system itself is being is built with favor. Uh, mm -hmm. And especially after the launch of uh, Cyberpunk 2077, I am definitely in that camp of people that really didn't like, um, it still doesn't like the game, not only just because of the just rocky start with the bugs and everything it has, I also really don't like the game on a kind of mechanical standpoint. I think this the skill tree is incredibly uh, dull, and the, the, there's certain aspects of the world that could have been fluffed out more. I think the story is, is good. Um... I wasn't too like pleased with it, and so I was kind of like kind of used that energy to kind of feel like okay, I want to do something that's better. I want to do something that's different and new. Uh, it's ambitious, mm -hmm. uh, but it's still a quality product in this sort of space. So that if people are coming from Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven displeased and like okay, I didn't really like that, they can pick up you know favor and say okay, well, I want to do my own thing. Where I get my I get my, I get, my, I get control over the over the the world and the system myself. Mm -hmm. Um, so I can tell the story that, you know, I can, I can do things how I want to do, do things. Yeah. Cause that's kind of where I was coming from in creating, in creating this whole thing. Now with that, with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, um, on the campaign page, it talks about your set, your setting, um, having technology indistinguishable from ma from magic. And given, given that, given that kind of setup, would you say that, would you say that tech wise, um, favor has more in common with Shadowrun's mix of te of tech and magic rather than the strictly tech based approach of Cyberpunk. Sure, yeah, I would definitely say it has way more approach to approach to that. I kind of like a little bit how we how we did that. Uh, it's definitely not a new thing of like a science fantasy sort of thing. I think that's definitely a genre in and of itself. And uh, we kind of took that approach to our like race aspect of. Um, of our game, especially during character creation, the way that all those fantasy elements come into play is because the like the the setting the world the 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 system is on on Morix, which is the planet it's on, is so far away from original Earth, and because of the backstory of the world, which is this big stellar war happened, which basically separated Morix from the rest of humanity. Um, so far in the future the people of Morix have kind of lost um, lost touch with what is true and false about old old Earth culture. And so a lot of these mythologies and these pantheons and these legends of older history, um, people don't people aren't really too sure if those are true or false. And so they kind of try with culture in in, I don't know, present day uh, favor to emulate a lot of those fantasy elements mm -hmm. with a lot of like genetic modification um, and all that stuff kind of very prevalent in the in society. And so that's why you'll see people that um, modify themselves to me like a Jodan, like an like kind of like ice um, troll of sorts or like a, an elf sort of aesthetic. Um, or people that also just pursue more of the cybernetic sort of things or try to find a more down to earth um, sort of like monastic sort of appeal to what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is it's definitely much more similar to to Shadowrun. Uh, that there there isn't really necessarily magic, but it is almost portrayed as if it is because that's how the culture sort of perceives it. All right, I, I got I can definitely get behind that. Um, and give now given the. Given the set, given the um, setup that you have with the with with how it works, um, I'll s I'd like to I'd like to dig a little bit further into this into the um, die system that you have, which is a d which is described as a d10 dice pool um, framework. Now, whenever I think of dice pools, I usually think of the attribute plus skill um, formula, whether it's you're rolling that number of dice or you're rolling a set number of dice plus plus attribute and skill as a modifier. Right. 
and some sometimes it's aim high, sometimes it's aim low, because there's a, there can be a lot of there can be a lot of variance right. with just with just one type of dice. Um, how when in these myriad of paradigms, um, where does Favor's die pool system fall in? It falls very similar to how uh, World of Darkness does their systems, very similar to Vampire the Masquerade specifically. Mm -hmm. We drew a lot of inspiration from their system, as it is a very simple system. Um, and the way that our thing works is similar to theirs, where you take your, in this case, for our system specifically, it's your attribute plus any specialization you have. Um, and you build a dice pool, and you succeed if any of those D10s roll as an 8, 9, or 10. So you roll a uh, dice pool of 5, you know, maybe you're rolling just your might to, to try to pry open a door. You roll your 5 dice, you've got your 5 points in might. If any of those come up as an 8, 9, or 10, because the difficulty rating is just a 1, it only needs one success to bust open this door. It's a very, uh, not very sturdy door. <laughs> you just get one success, and you just barge right through. Um, so our system falls very, very similar to kind of how World of Darkness does their, mm -hmm. does their system. Now, with that, with that kind of thing in, with that kind of thing in mind, um, I'd like you to extrapolate on it using a talent system. Because there's a lot of ways I can take that. Indeed, yes, yeah. We, I think we. That's one thing that we're definitely going to improve on our, on our page, especially if we have to relaunch. Is kind of going into more detail with the with the system. So that's a good piece of feedback we've been given from everyone. So I definitely want to do more of that going forward. The talent system is our sort of so favor itself is a class less system, and talents are our way to progress characters. And the way that you'll kind of take your character is when you build your character for the first time, you say, okay, you know, I have all of these talent options available to me. And they're kind of like feats or like single abilities that you'll take to kind of customize how you want to play the game. And then each of those talents has a progression system built into that. So they have like a set sort of tier from like one to one to, I think normally it's five. Some of them are like lower or higher that if you enjoy those talents, you want to do more of that stuff. Say you playing like a more gun focused, like, Character, you might pick up some of the, the you might pick up like the duelist talent and get some more points of that, which lets you, you know, um, use pistols better. And that has a built-in progression system for that talent, which lets you, if you put more points into it, to uh, get better, to increase the attributes of that talent. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, you can just straight up take other talents. You can diversify, you know, as much as you want, or you can hyper specialize as much as you want. Uh, so we want to create a classless system that still enable people to say to to fill a role that they want to fill, um, and to kind of design their character the way they want it to want to design, without having you know without having an issue of uh, that shadow runs into where yeah you you kind of get pigeonholed into doing specific things uh, because you know they're necessary for what your character you know, what for what your character's trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's kind of how that's kind of how we built that we built that system. All right. And given um, given that given that it's talking about mixing and matching, I'm guessing that there's not. I'm guessing that um, talent trees are a bit um, looser. They are, yeah. And we have a we have a bunch of talents that also synergize with other talents, or certain talents that um, that you can unlock through combining different talents. Uh, just to kind of encourage, encourage people to play around with things, to look into things, and especially with just how the talents are read. We also try to make it very simple looking, just giving people a summary page for the talents to see, you know, hey, do any of these talents pop out to you? What are you interested in doing? Just so people that are more interested in just playing the game, not really getting too much into the numbers, mm -hmm. are just able to kind of pick the ones that, that sound interesting to them and move along. Um, but those talents are expanded upon and detailed so that people that do want to go into the depths and into the numbers for the, for their characters are able to do so. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, there, there's, there's a, there's a lot of just, um, we, we kind of, we wanted to, we didn't want to punish people for going super versatile or super wide. And we didn't really want to punish people for going super narrow. So we wanted to kind of make both options like viable, uh, for people. So we tried to. It's it's a very it's a very hard balance to kind of like to hit right, mm -hmm. um, but I'm pr I'm pretty pleased with kind of where we're at with with that system. I think of course there's plenty of time to always do play testing and make adjustments and stuff. But that's kind of like the overall like scope of what we're trying to do with uh, with the talents. So mm -hmm. now, 
given given that given that, and I also I also noticed the whole line of take your characters from first level schmucks to twentieth level um, street gods, because a <laughs> lot of times freeform systems don't utilize levels. Usually, they do a experience as right. currency kind of approach. Right. Um, so I'm I'm cur I'm curious I'm curious what prompted you guys to take a to take a more traditional system of leveling. Yeah, it's it's I mean it's it's kind of like I guess I guess it was really an attempt to still try to be unique I suppose and do something do something new. Um, so we still wanted to try to like do a sort of level based like system and still enable like freeform uh, sort of stuff. So I guess I I don't know I I wish I had a better answer for this. <laughs> But I guess it was sort of a choice born more out of out of interest to see how it would go, um, and interest to be you know unique and have a, a sort of different aspect to it, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Now, taking that taking that in, taking that into account, um, since you you've made some you've made some more magical allu illusions in the in this in this kind of setup. So, and given the um, Given the unique approach that Shadowrun has to magic, with, well, with the whole mm -hmm. um, drain mechanic that it does, right? Um, I'm curious if magic use has its own set of mechanics that have to be taken into taken into account, or its or its own resource, or anything like that. Yeah, everything sort of runs through the talent system when it comes to gaining new abilities, and and that applies to gaining new magical abilities. Uh, so there are talents that let you cause someone to burst into flame. Um, and that's just through, and there's just like, mechanically speaking, there's just a, you know, you're spending, you know, that's like a certain action cost um, to do that sort of thing. Uh, and there are, there are, though there are some of the talents that do give a, like, resource to the player to use. Um, we kind of wanted to simplify things by running all of that stuff through, like, the talent system. And those talents will tell you, hey, this is what you need to do in order to do this to use this ability mm -hmm. instead of trying to refer to some other section in the book or some other place in order to understand that stuff uh, and magic has and like unlike you know um shadow run there's no penalty to using magic with cybernetics and you know all that jazz um and there's no like we try we try, we try not to kind of create um mechanics that like dependent on, on dependent on other like mechanics in a book we kind of tried to keep things as like modular and as sectioned as we could so it was easier to read and to get into um but those systems still fit together like a like a nice jigsaw puzzle with, with each other so yeah and this this brings me to the other to the other thing that is a case where there's a whole lot of arguing about how to do it and nobody can agree nobody can agree on a proper method let's address the elephant in the room that is known as hacking <laughs> Indeed, I uh, so hacking as a more um, sorry for for hacking to me is both uh, like actual digital hacking and stuff, and also so like a TTRPG designer taking sections of another system and hacking them together or whatever. So, but um, since we're dealing with a since we're dealing with a <laughs> setting with cyberpunk leanings, I'm pretty sure you know which um, end of the spectrum yes. I'm going on this. <laughs> so hacking. Hmm. Hacking was interesting to do. Um, we try to... So, with hacking, we gave different electronic, like, things that people had, like, whether they were consoles or their, like, smart guns or their, like, heads-up display visors or whatever. Um, those kind of, like, they, they're, like, I don't want to say they exist as entities in the world, but they're, like, interactable things for when someone has a talent that interacts with those things. So if you take, like, hacking talents, you get the ability to hack into a piece of uh, a tech that the enemy has to disable their visors, so it cause them to be blind for a second, to cause their gun to misfire, um, to all that, you know, we, we kind of tried to, to... I guess our system is a bit more of... A cheesy sort of like unrealistic thing, but we, we we try to create a sort of like cyber combat sort of thing, so that characters when they're in combat that have hacking abilities can do on the fly, real time like hacking or like manipulation of enemy like systems and stuff, or, or like 
alternatively increasing the strength of their own uh, or overclocking their own allies gear or their own gear and stuff like that um, so with like with like combat it's just, it's kind of a way for a like cybernetic character or a character that has hacking stuff to have a different way to approach combat to have a cool thing that they're doing uh, to help out and stuff so uh, there's just there's just di there's different pieces of like equipment you'll purchase and stuff that have different effects um, and again we try to keep all that stuff uh, like as as contained as we could and as simple as we could um, mm -hmm. so it's not just like it, it, we're not getting like super bogged down into the numbers when it comes to like hacking and stuff so yeah now with with all with that in with that in mind I do want I do want to delve a little bit into um into the equipment end of things, because now we've we've talked we've talked a we've talked a little bit about the about the inclusion of cyberware and bioware essentially, um, right. but what I'm what I'm really curious about is cu is customization. Will there will there be a me will there be methods for people to customize and and mod and mod out um their equipment? Oh yeah, so I I really I really love the system we did for our equipment. This is like some of the coolest like my favorite aspects of what we what we did. So when approaching equipment, we use what we call a keyword system, where we made a list of keywords that have certain effects, um, and you could apply those keywords to a category of. Uh, let's say we take the, take the weapons for instance, right? Mm -hmm. We have a small arms category where there are a list of pistols that have certain costs that each do uh, a set amount of like damage, they have like a range and stuff like that. And then we have a list of keywords, which, which are basically attachments, which the player can purchase as additional things to then add to their, their weapons or their, maybe their armor or their cybernetic equipment, mm -hmm. um, just their utility items. And it allows for like this super like customizable approach, which... As well, if the player doesn't want to take all that time to go into that detail with this stuff, they can just purchase the base equipment and just call it that, uh, mm -hmm. which just you know has, which is simple, has all the data right there. Um, but if they want to say like I want to have a pistol with a silencer, I grab the pistol I want, I check in the attachments category, I buy the silencer, which adds the silenced keyword to the weapon, uh, which just makes it silent, you know, when you're firing it or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I love that we have we have this like super cool. Um, very modular approach to, and that applies to like all the equipment across the across the board. Oh, and speaking of, speaking of that kind of thing, whenever you're de whenever there's always there always seems to be a bit of a tug of war affair go affair going on when it comes to when it comes to melee and ranged weaponry, especially the, especially the more modern yeah. the tech, the more modern or um, futuristic or speculative even the tech gets. So. An easy qu a, a question that I have on that front is: Would some would someone who wanted to wanted to do a me a very melee close close range centric build um, still be viable? Sure. Yeah. With with combat on the, taking an approach to like melee and range combat, we tried to like equalize the playing field per se, and both melee and ranged have their advantages. But they generally do the same amount of like damage across the board, um, so we try to make both like approaches to combat um, like viable, mm -hmm. especially just because we we wanted the combat to feel simple and easy to easy to run, uh, and just enc encourage like DMs and players to be cunning, to think on their feet, to find different ways to use their equipment that in each individual scenario that gives them a a it gives them an advantage in the in, this, in the circumstance mm -hmm. rather than trying to quantify those advantages in the rules we try to leave it open for the players to um be creative in that aspect i suppose mm -hmm. um and of course like there's going to be issues with balancing and that that is what it is and we of course we're still you know to this day Still making small edits here and there, and running a playtest group, and making changes and stuff. Um, make sure that that both sides are um, like viable per se. Mm -hmm. And so it, it it is just it kind of is a, a a 
a constant struggle, uh, but such as the such as the nature of these things. But yeah, we, we we tried as best we could to try to make make both things equally viable. So it's it's it kind of the the ball kind of lands more in the like flavor side of the of the ballpark where if your character wants to be a melee character go and do that there's no punishment for that you know um aside from you making bad choices in combat <laughs> or if you want to be like a a heavy gun toting brute you know there's mm-hmm. weapons for that there's talents for that there's races for that um go wild so now with that with that kind of with that, with that in mind um a lot of games have have some sort of extra effort mechanic. Um, Shadowrun, for instance, has edge. Um, World of Darkness has willpower. Um, hero points have been have been used technically right. in Pathfinder, but it's but it's a but it's been a to the back kind of thing, so it's not right. used all it's not used all that often. Um, does favor have anything similar? It does, yeah. We we took a page straight out of fifth edition's book, and we have a mechanic called leverage, mm-hmm. which functions very similarly. That it gives you an extra, um, an extra small um, bonus. I think I think it's a, it's an extra die right now to to roll um, into your into your pool for and that, and that, and that is literally that is, that is a DM's tool to apply to anything. Uh, and there's also certain there's also of course in the system there's different things that give you leverage for stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is the thing for the players to request like hey you know i want to use this particular like um aspect of my character that you know doesn't necessarily read that it, it can work in this situation um but i think i think it could if i apply it like this and the dm the dm could just say like, hey that's that's a good idea i like that i'll give you leverage give you leverage for that mm-hmm. um or i think that the dm can just give out to play a player say okay i like I like what you're doing here i'm gonna give you leverage for that um so that's kind of the way that like players can push themselves or apply themselves to circumstance and then get rewarded for doing so. All right. Now, now, with that kind of th- with that kind of thing in mind, since you mentioned that World of Darkness is what is what you used as a frame of reference when it came to your die system, I'm guess I'm guessing that it's still it's still I'm guessing that first it's still a success based um approach. Right. Um. So with that in mind, what is the what is the what is the lucky number? What is the number that a die has to go over in order in order to count as a hit? So the success number is eight through ten. So it's a bit it's one I think that's one higher hmm. than uh, original World of Darkness. I think I think like original v- VTM was like seven and up. I think if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, Ours uses eight to eight to eight to ten, but we have a small, slightly hot, like larger, like dice pool when it comes to attributes to kind of make up for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we just adjust things to decrease the difficulty of something. The DM just adds additional difficulties onto that. So you need you need, you need one die to come up as an eight, nine, or ten, or you need two dice to come up as an eight, nine, or ten. Um, and so it just it just functions like very like same way that that Wool of Darkness. Um, system does and i'm realizing now as well uh, i want to correct myself is that the way that we use leverage is uh, leverage is the thing that um we leverage leverage is the thing that makes the check in question uh any dice that come up um as a seven also succeed in that in that particular role so leverage we just use as a thing where uh you can lower the the difficulty of something um through, through the same thing I mentioned before, just being creative and clever or whatever. So I, I knew I knew I was screwing that up before, so I want to go back and check. Um, but yeah. that's how that works too. So um, some variations of the storyteller system have it where tens count twice. Do you guys have anything like that? We do. Yes, um, that is a thing where if it comes up um, as a as a ten. Um, Oh well, goodness me! And I actually forgot to mention this earlier too. Is when things come up as a um, as a ten, uh, the success instead of being applied to that particular role, uh, instead the player gains what's called a point of morale, 
which is a thing they can use as an automatic success um, for some for some for like anything else. It's kind of like a uh, what's it called inspiration sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever whenever you come up as, as a ten, you get a point of of, of morale instead. And as well as that, if you roll a a one, um, that that counts as like critical failure failure, and that that counts the way it normally does in World of Darkness, where it just takes away a success as well as just being a failure in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So. And I, I should I should mention that morale earlier as a, as an, another thing that um, can be used as like an extra effort thing, but I also forgot that as well. So yeah. my bad. Um, and when and that brings me to, since we've talked about successes, I need to ask about failure because um, there's di there's been different ways on that on adding some sort of extra wrinkles to fa to failures, whether it be glitches in sh in Shadowrun. Which is not necessarily a failure thing; it's more of a mm -hmm. and but, as I've called it. Um, <laughs> you roll, you roll enough, you roll enough, th you roll enough ones on on a roll, and something happens. Right. Um, it could be a case of you succeed, and or you succeed, but. Um, right. And of co and of course, um, World of Darkness has it that it's a, that it's a botch if. You right. don't get any hits, and you rolled at least one one. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys have anything similar to that? So for for failures, we do just we do just take a simple approach of if you if you fail, you fail, um, mm -hmm. and uh, so we kind of give it to the DM to say like, okay, is it a situation where like. Like uh, trying to move silently and you fail that causes you to, or, or like um, trying to move, trying to move silently and you fail that by a you know critical margin causes you to instead to um, not only to fail the sneak but to also trip and cause problems for yourself. Mm -hmm. You kind of leave that more to the whim of the DM to to decide that stuff. We just didn't want to. We we felt like we already had a lot of like we had we had enough. For the rolling, we didn't want to create more additional, um, like baggage, I suppose, onto it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is something that we have considered in the past and do toy around with. Um, but we just feel like it, it right right now. It's just it kind of better to leave that stuff in the hands of the storyteller. Um, which, if they feel like they want to heighten the the scene, or if the if the role you know uh, would make sense to have additional consequences um to find a way to do that mm -hmm. um or just kind of or just kind of or yeah kind of use that sort of like um you know if but system of like okay because you failed this thing what might happen as a result of that in, in addition to just you not doing the thing right yeah. so um now when it comes to when it comes to combat i'm curious if you i'm curious if characters in favor are on the uh, are a bit squishy or it or I'm not and also and also are you guys using a hit point approach or are you guys using a wound system yeah characters are definitely on the more squishy side of things mm -hmm. um, this is something that I realized when playing a lot of blades in the dark which is probably my, probably my favorite favorite system of all time I love blades in the dark it's a fantastic system and their their characters are very squishy because they do want to impress upon the players that hey if you're getting into combat that is a serious commitment right you have to make sure you're considering these things before they happen that um, if that's what it comes down to play smart play safe uh, take care of yourself and encourages the the players to think outside the box mm -hmm. uh, in addition to just rolling to hit something because um, we can all roll to hit something. Um, but I want you know I want I want the system to encourage people to uh, to get into things to have fun to think outside the box uh, and to use the the tools they have you know they have acquired throughout throughout character creation and throughout gameplay. Mm -hmm. So characters do end up being squishier, and yeah. we do we do still use a we use a health point system um, to kind of simplify things simplify things rather than trying to do like a wounds or a stamina sort of thing. Uh, we, just, we just went with a standard standard health thing. Yeah. Um, and, of course, there's plenty of things like talents and equipment that interact with that beyond just damaging people. Um, 
but that's just that's just kind of a way that we that's kind of our same approach we take we took to the entire system was okay we have we have a health point system and that's just as, as kind of the unifying tying thing that's like that's a simple health point system mm -hmm. and then from that we kind of said okay what aspects of this health uh, this health system can we then um like like be creative and like kind of extrapolate on with like talents or with equipment or whatever else um, so in those other systems, we created interesting ways to interact with health, um, rather than trying to front load everything on health, on the health system instead. Mm -hmm. And given that, given that, given that, um, now with, now with character creation, it's, you, um, you've hinted at a set of paths, which for all intents and purposes are your, are your answer to meta types. And what I'm Given what you've mentioned about right. the talent system, how much how much of a fa how much of a factor does your does your starting path between Jotun, Seed, Augmented, and Traditionalist play? Yeah, so those share the same same side of, kind of idea we had with talents, where you pick your you, we're calling them anthroforms basically, mm -hmm. uh, which it's similar to metatypes, same sort of stick. You pick them when you first create your character, and at like level one of those anthroforms, they give you like a basic ability, a basic set of things. Mm -hmm. And then at, through time, you'll level up that form as you go on. Same thing as you do with a talent. Um, that as you choose chosen to stick with that, as time goes on, you get better at using that form. You increase your own strength. You increase your own you know cunning. Um, and so that's kind of how it works as well. And the ones that we have there is just a very small subset, subset of what the ones that we plan, we plan to add. Many, many more than those. But they all share the same sort of idea of... Um, like with the with the with taking the the augmented Anthroform as an example here, uh, the Anthroform, Anthroform that is more cybernetically enhanced, mm -hmm. um, they have immediate abilities that they, they give you, um, and then as you go down through that, they give you more abilities along that line and level up. They level up with you essentially as as yeah. you go. Um, of course, I'm, I'm guessing I'm guessing there's a there's a similar path with the with the others. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. With all, with all of them so far. I will I will note that when I re when I read through the when I read through the description and I looked at the one for the seed and I I immediately went well I know which one I'm hating. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's not against that's not against you specifically. No, it's more no, of a it's more yeah. it's more of a it's more of a policy. I hate elves. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Uh, I probably have what what the fudge would I, would I choose? I probably hate like I don't know. Probably probably freaking like halflings. Or something like nimble and annoying. It's probably it's probably my probably my similar like just as a, as a player who's had too many bad experiences with players with too light fingers <laughs> taking my stuff <laughs> i um i've only ha i've only hated ha halflings in warhammer and that and that's because that's because of that's because of the of the, of the fact that they um and specifically warhammer fantasy i should note yeah they have they have a ten they have a tendency to find new and interesting ways to piss off everyone <laughs> <laughs> Such is the nature of things, right? Jeez. Um, well, well it's, to, it's to the point that they almost started a war with an elector count until he decided to just turn around and say, "Oh, we've we've made we've made peace with them," and everybody just stood there dumbfounded. <laughs> but it's like, <laughs> okay, as long as you don't kill us, because yeah, um, or we're just we're just, we're just hanging out, you know, do your thing, <laughs> get yourself killed, or whatever. <laughs> That's fair. That is very fair. But with, now taking all that into account, how um how big would you how big would you say the the document um currently is? So right now our quick start document which for if you're listening to this is an industry term that refers to kind of the 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 alpha version that's kind of um used to portray content to the public is it's often the system reference document when it comes to post launch stuff like that our current like alpha document is about 80 pages or so mm -hmm. which is uh, including uh, graphic design formatting art sketches here and there in addition to all of the basic rules how to 
role checks and stuff, how to play combat, has a set of talents that are available, as well as an appendix for some equipment, and the anthroforms that are, that are present on the Kickstarter are in there as well. And plenty of just also, we with especially with Favor, we try to make it as even newbie-friendly as possible. Um, so even with our initial, like, chapter one is literally, like, in addition to how to play Favor, it's also how to play tabletop role-playing games to begin with. So anybody that is new to the scene that's picking up this game uh, as a first product, which, which isn't likely, obviously, but even if it is the case, it's easy for people to... Um, for new players to TTRPGs to get right into it. Mm -hmm. uh, we have all that stuff in here. And uh, for a post... like com like a completion, a post-launch uh, system, we're probably going to be aiming for the 300 page-ish mark around probably a, a, a little bit less than um, some of the other big uh, systems out there I think what is what's the player's handbook like 300 something pages I think um, uh, the, the are you talking about the 5e e, which players yeah, for, yeah, for, for five yeah for, for yeah saying, saying player's handbook do you have any idea how little that narrows it down <laughs> <laughs> true good point my bad <laughs> I did not say the rest of the sentence I should have said which was I think the player's handbook for fifth edition D and D. Three hundred and sixteen <laughs> pages. I just grabbed. Okay, I just cool. grabbed the thing open just to pr just to prove the bit because I am that petty. <laughs> there you go. Um, and then, and of course, like that, and that's def that's that's D and D. Of course, is the the Dungeon Master's Guide and also the the Monster Manual, which are their own giant books in their own right. Um, our book will have uh, all the stats for monsters and all the. The, both the guides for the DM and also the uh, stuff for the player all in one book, which will equal about 300 to 400 pages, probably closer to 300 pages, mm -hmm. including art pieces and uh, formatting and all that, all that jazz. So Although, definitely a, a bit, definitely a bit, a bit ambitious for a, a first project, but we, we did want to kind of have a, a, to make a complete, a complete game, I suppose. So. Mm -hmm. um, and to be, to be fair, 300 pages is average. Like right. When, when you want to talk, when you when I think of when I think of when I think of giant books, I'm thinking of I'm thinking of say hero the um, character creation book for hero system, which is how big is that? Now this is just the this is just volume one <laughs> of hero system sixth edition, volume. which is all about character creation. And keep in mind, Hero System is a un is a more universal style game. Right. So, it goes at it goes at a to it goes at a total of a little over four hundred and sixty. Holy frick! Oh my gosh, that is a lot. <laughs> yeah, ours I, lot I, I, have, I have I have I have told people that any anybody who comes to me talking about how. How any how um D, how D and D is too how D and D is too ma is too math heavy for them. I will find them and beat them half to death with my copy of G with my copy of Hero System, and then beat the other half with my copy of GURPS. Oh gosh, yeah, GURPS is oh my word. There's so much with that. Gosh, how old is GURPS at this point? It's got to be two decades old, right? At this point, right? If not three. Um. Let, let me let me double yeah, check. More? Yeah, and there's like there's been so many supplements for that. Both official, both I mean, official, and, both official and right. un and unofficial, um, and of course it's tangentially related to Fallout. GURPS, <laughs> it's for um, technically it's for its first publication was the man to man version in '85. Oh um, gosh, but it's yeah, actual more. it's actual first and second editions were in '86. Ay ay <laughs> Let's yeah, not so forget that it's the let's not forget it's the only game that Steve Jackson Games is the only company I know of that that got ra that got raided by the Secret Service. <laughs> <laughs> what was that for? Just because they thought he was being sus or something, or like... no? It was be it was because of a misunderstanding over GURPS Cyberpunk. Because it had, because somebody thought it was a it was a legit hacking manual. <laughs> Gosh, that is one thing I'm glad with all this uh, the the mainstreamification of tabletop is getting getting rid of these stupid stigmas that are attached to it. Oh my gosh, 
Just because some bad apples wrote some bad articles back in the day that have haunted this haunted this this uh, scene for the, the past like forty years. I'm glad I'm glad we're finally getting I'm glad finally getting ready to get rid of this. Oh, there's 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 gonna there's gonna be some there's gonna be some new takes. I mean, pe- I mean, oh, yeah, people sure. still unironically um, try try and argue the whole vi- the whole violence correlation when it comes to video games. Right. Yeah, um, that's true. I ha- always always some bad apples. Um, I I have ge- I have ge- I have generally applied Hanlon's razor to the whole thing. Never assume, never attribute malice what can be adequately explained by stupidity. That's a great saying. <laughs> um, and I'll keep I'll keep using that saying as long as it keeps working. And so far, it's kept working. <laughs> um, that's, that's definitely true. <laughs> do, do you find yourself? Uh, I'll ask you. I'll ask you a question for once. <laughs> do you find yourself uh, like frustrated or annoyed with the caliber of like newcomers and newbies that are flooding into the scene nowadays? Or is it more of like a uh, like how do you, how do you how do you feel about that that whole thing? It's quite it's quite a, a movement, I guess, in our small little niche uh, niche um, world. Yes, yes, and it's a case of yes and no because mm-hmm. well, for starters, a good a good chunk of the old school crowd doesn't doesn't care for me simply because of the fact that I ha- I had the gall to not fo- to not focus on just one on just one game and that and that was it, like a lot of people did. Um, and, uh, they're lost, <laughs> and there and there's the fact that when it comes to certain older editions, I will I I will praise what I will praise what I like, and I will call out what I don't like. Cool, but just like any just like anything else. Um, That's a good take. And the thing when it comes to when it comes to this this um influx, I'm per, I'm perfectly I'm perfectly fine with with bringing more people in to oh, yeah. a. But there are but there are um, caveats. Okay. Because there because there is there are a couple um there are a few types of new t- of newcomers that I do that I do not care for specific. A lot of them can fall into the category of people who don't put in the work. Mm-hmm. Um. That's fair. That's a good point. I I would I would run get, I would run um, one shots at my LGS. And mm-hmm. I could always tell when there was that one person who would come in whose only exposure was Critical Role. <laughs> now, I don't watch Critical Role. I know about I know about it because people keep bringing up Matt Mercer right. to me. I don't yeah. care. I don't care about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I only ever I only ever get annoyed when one somebody do, somebody does the but Matt Mercer did it like blank, and I have to remind them I'm not Matt Mercer. He's mm-hmm. short. He's probably much shorter than me because he's an actor. <laughs> um, <laughs> two. Yeah, two. When you're in Rome, you do as the Romans do, and as far as anyone is concerned, I'm the em- I'm the emperor. Once I'm, once I'm behind the GM screen. <laughs> and I, think, I like that. That's and three. Case. And three. Do do not. This is this is a this is something that ha- that happened a few t- that happened a few times. So, I'm running a. F- I'm run. I decide my roulette ends up landing on fantasy that week, and I decide to pick mm-hmm. um, Earth Dawn, a game that mm-hmm. I've, ru- which start, which was kind of a sister to Shadowrun, but now isn't because because of who owns what. It's mm-hmm. it's a long story. All right. But Earth Dawn is a fantasy game, but trying to apply some of the things that you might be familiar with from say D and D. You're mm-hmm. gonna you're gonna be walking you're gonna be walking out in public with your pants down, <laughs> and there and there was one one person at the table who was ask who was asking who was who was asking qu- asking questions, and and acting like the game was weird because because of the fact that it wasn't following in those tropes. When there's a big mm-hmm. sign at the door saying "Expect the unexpected." <laughs> for, for this, for this kind, for this kind of thing, because every the people who who know me know that just because, just because I may be running something familiar, you can't you can't assume that you know how things are going to work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that's fair. That's a very good take. That's the big, but the bigger issue that I ha- that I have is in long t- is the long game. Mm-hmm. 
my con my concern, and I, I don't I don't consider my, I don't consider myself an an old vet. I'm only I'm I'm only in my I'm only in my thirties. Um, mm -hmm. But what? But I do re I do recall the D twenty bubble that happened from two thousand to about right. two thousand five, right. where everybody and their brother, their sister, their un their uncle, their monkey's uncle, and their baby's mama had a d had some D twenty book out. And I, I'd argue it's still it's still going. Um, it's not it's it is not nearly as bad as as bad as it was where um where the, That's bad, where yeah. it was getting. The fact that so many people are doing it digitally um, right. helps help soft help soften the blow. But right. our, but in the early two thousands, that what that wasn't as much of a thing. Right. Um, this was when D and D was still um, was still flirting with that whole web enhancement idea. Right. Which thankfully they stopped. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the but the problem but the reason I point that out is when is you had you had so much of a flood of ju of just d of just d and d related content that you mm -hmm. had, that you ended that you ended up seeing a burnout and ju mm -hmm. just a burnout in the market flood because i i remember right. go i remember going into different sto different stores up and up and down my area and seeing several shelves worth of d and d first and third party supplemental material right. and right. May maybe if you're lucky you'll see you'll see um, sh you'll see Shadowrun, or you'll, or you'll right. see, um, you'll, s I mean, I, th I think I saw, one, I think I saw one in a half, I, I saw some, uh, I saw a box set of Shadows on it at half price <laughs> books once, or, or the, or the like, or may maybe you'll get, you'll be, you'll get as lucky as I did and find a copy sure. of, um, Legend of the Five Rings third edition. <laughs> um, okay. And the, pr a lot of a lot of people a lot of people talk about how about how accepted the hobby is when really it isn't you have you still have a very right. top heavy problem and if it really was right. that accepted i wouldn't need mildra would not need to exist <laughs> um and my my concern is that because of the explosive amount of growth that we that we've seen in the last 4 years right are i have the question I have to keep asking myself is: Are we going to head to another bubble? And if so, and if so, right. who, if so, who's going to remain standing in in the aftermath? Right. The person who remains who remains standing in the in the third in the third edition bubble, when that when that burst was Paizo. Yeah, it's true. I was going to say that too because that that's when Pathfinder, um. His Pathfinder kind of existed because of that whole bubble, right? Pathfind Pathfinder was uh, was already uh, was already around at that point, but because but because of because of the fact that they were putting out consistent high quality modules, and then sure. there, and then there was the whole scubness with fourth edition, which helped really accelerate the process. <laughs> that's that's the vibe that that's the vibe that I'm going, and that's why I um I have right. some long term concerns when it comes to Pathfinder second edition. Um, yeah. You know, it's the it's the age old strategy of look a, of look a hundred moves ahead, and mm. a lot of the, a lot of the a, and a lot of the people who ha, who um who have get, who got in through through actual plays, whether it be Critical Role or something else. The big question that I have to ask is much like much like how I asked how how many how many MCU fans are becoming comic readers, how <laughs> many Critical Role fans. Are becoming D are becoming D and D players or DMs, right? And right. is it possible that some people are? Yeah, but I haven't seen enough evidence to see to see that there, to see that enough people are converting. Simply, right. simply because there there can be the reasonable argument of why why would I convert when the shows when the show's still there? But eventually, the show's right. going to end. Right. One form or, through one form or another, either it's right. going to end or it's going to or it's going to overstay its welcome in some form. Right. Right. And that's true. That that's that. And when that happens, a lot of the people who jumped in when when it when it when people were relying on the strength of brand, they're mm -hmm. not going to stick around. Look at all the people who bought a Nintendo Wii when when that was making gangbusters, and how many people didn't stick didn't how many people didn't stick around for more than just Wii Sports? Yeah, that's true. 
Or even, even when the Wii U came out, that just completely flopped. <laughs> well, there, there's a there's a bunch of reasons why the Wii why the Wii U didn't why the Wii U didn't work. Mm -hmm. Um, but the the point the point that I'm trying to make is that the is that um the runaway success that's that can happen with these kind of things, um, if you can ha can have a lot of can have a lot of long term pitfalls. You look at right. you look at a lot of you look at a lot of businesses and a lot of ideas that go belly up, and a narrative that you tend to see a lot is people focusing way too much on short on short term gains, right. and damn the consequences. Right, right. Yeah, because because if we like, especially like right now, even like looking at the margin of like content created, if you just look at Kickstarter, be like. Uh, as just a case study, mm -hmm. there is like a vast majority of it is supplemental for D and D fifth edition specifically. It's like a crazy amount. I think it's well, well over like half, right? Um, to as a further as a further illustration of this point, and I know I've kind of gotten ranty on this on this kind of thing. Oh, um, I love it. I love this cool dude. <laughs> I um, now I, I've I've interviewed this, I've interviewed Discami Publishing sev several mm -hmm. times, um, and I backed um, Anime Five E. And I've been and I did I did see that yeah. Um, something an interesting thing that I that I saw in the first few days of its PDF release on the um, on the Anime Five E Facebook group mm -hmm. was a lot of people crying foul over the fact that it is not strictly speaking compatible with D and D Fifth Edition. Really? And, oh my and in gosh! Fact, <laughs> and in fact, Anime Five E is a hybrid of a hybrid of elements between D between the D twenty system. And um, the tristat system from Big Eyes Small Mouth, in the same way that say um, Fusion, spelled with a Z, from um, from which was a hybrid of elements from from the Hero system and the Interlock system that's used in Cyberpunk. Interesting. Um. Hmm. And and do do you think you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? I think it. I think it's a. I think it's a case in. I think it's a case in point. That, I th that um for a lo for a lot of for a lot of people that for a lot of people it's the def and I've I've seen this plenty of times, and this is the re this is the reason why I've often argued against having one game as the game for a given right. table. Right. Because of whenever so whenever because when you do that. You end up developing an idea about how about how things are supposed to work, and then oh, you gosh, uh, then you come so across true. some sort of system where things don't work that way. Oh, that's and, so true. <laughs> and you're left and you're left holding your dick. <laughs> that is that is so on point because that that I have felt that especially recently with my own personal gaming group mm -hmm. of like I, I I think it was like last like. Two weeks ago, I was having this conversation with a couple of members, mm -hmm. and going just like, "Okay, how many times have have the have the 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 have we the we the stupid idiots, the three stooges here, sat down at a table and gone, okay, we want to play a game, and guess what that game is? Oh, it's fifth edition! Hey, <laughs> everyone's just like, we pl we played like how many campaigns of this? Like what five, six, seven, eight or so?" I'm just like okay. Next time I sit down to run a game, I'm promising myself right now it's gonna it's gonna be a different system because we're just stuck in this loop where we've just done everything. Well, um, <laughs> well, if you <laughs> if you want if you want if you want ideas on on that, you know you know where you oh, know where to find you know where to find. I should, I should, I should hit you up. <laughs> that would be great. Because um, it, it's just it's just it, it, you're right. It is just such a. A problem when you when you start to hold like you hold that game in this case fifth fifth edition D and D mm -hmm. to that to to every like every other game to that standard right which is just unfair and that's like that that is a way like looking forward as you said that that is the way that we're going to kill whatever innovation someone else might bring to the table you just say hey I got this really cool idea for this new system mm -hmm. and it's gonna it's gonna be terrible if the idea is shot down because oh it's just it's just not as good as 5e or it's just not the same or it just isn't like it isn't like 5e so that's just not going to work yeah and i've seen i've seen that now i want to i want to make clear i've seen i've seen that this isn't something new for right. fi, for 5e that or for uh, D, D. this is this is just the latest example of that and it's not even yeah, something true. that's it's something that's 
I'd say a consequence of a, of a lot of people looking at that looking at that one game. And to mm-hmm. be fair, in up and up until up until I'd say t- until 2008 or even even to even 2000 um se- even 2006 if I if I want to be if I want to be fair. Um, mm-hmm. I could understand why people would have that notion because it was it was tri- it because you had to really dig around the trenches to find a lot of a lot of indie creations, right, right. Um, or or go to your LGS and pr- and pray that you and pray that you happen to luck out that week. Yeah, so some someone's got some old book they got somewhere. <laughs> um, it's new, <laughs> but in an, in an age when 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 it is. When it is pants on head, retardedly easy to get access to information, I am far inclined to be kind about the matter. True, true. I like that. That's funny. <laughs> um, like if if somebody wants to stick with D and D and and the like, okay, f- okay, fine. More power right. to you. It's all good in the hood. Right. Right. But, but don't piss on my head and tell me it's raining. Right, 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 right. Don't. Don't tell. Don't tell me about how about how accepting it is when you, when right. when you when the same people who say that end up turning their nose at people tr- at people trying to make trying to do some do something that they want to do. Right. Uh, uh, that's so, the ultimate point. That's a very good way to put yeah. that. Um, I I don't mean I don't I don't mean to sound ho- I don't mean to sound hostile about that. It. It's more it's more of I've, no, I've I love a, it. I love it. I've seen that's a lot a of point. people. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people try and pre- try and present a narrative that is not actually present. Right. Um, it's one. It's one that can certainly appear with all the with all the media coverage, and and the like. But, um, that but that's that kind of approach is not is not what got me in, is not what got me interested interested. And like I like I said before right. we went live, the monastery is aims to aims to be the red letter media of tabletop. <laughs> but with with all with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy, and enjoy oh, the no. madness here. Thank you. Yeah, I love this. I love being in these hallowed halls. So thank you for having me here. <laughs> um, this is a wonderful interview. Yep. Yeah. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As wonderful. I often say around here, good. drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> That is a moniker I can get behind. <laughs> and of course, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty all. more. There will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>